Hey guys, welcome to our review of One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich and an abridged version of the Gulag Archipelago. Both of these are by Alexander Sojanichin. I might be butchering the name a bit there, if I am, apologies. These are some of the most influential books of the 20th century because they were what essentially worked as nails in the coffin of Soviet Russia. It was after Stalin had died, he was able to write some books and they were basically criticisms of the Gulag system. I say gulags, not gulags, because gulag was sort of, it's, uh, it was talking about all of the various prisons, sort of collectively. Now I'm going to cover a few things here relatively quickly. The book, as an audiobook, was well over 20 hours, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But it shines light on all manner of different things you're not aware of. For instance, I didn't know that in these prisons, if women were thrown in there, quite often what would happen is they'd have to prostitute themselves. So they'd either have to prostitute themselves to one of the gangs, who quite often would be polygamous, so you'd have a sort of top man who would have loads of women who'd have to sleep with him for protection, or they'd have to sleep with the guards, which is depressing. He also talked about the dequilligization, which essentially was you had, for about a generation or two, there had been some Slavic people who had been freed from slavery. That's what Slavic stands for. It's, it comes from the term slave. And what happens is you had the Pareto principle whereby a few people were successful and they used the success to invest more in equipment, to get more stuff, and they became more and more successful. Success as a way of snowballing. Then they made it so all private property is theft, it was all property of the state, or publicly owned but realistically, you know, the state, and they centralised power. And they got those people, threw them into Gulag. And the thing about the Gulag is... It, it was a mix, because it wasn't... A concentration camp where they intended to kill them, there were some places which were pretty austere and the hope was that if you could throw a political prisoner there they wouldn't come out. But it was also the case they were trying to use them for work because the thing is free labour, you know, slavery, which is selectively what it was there, was a pretty cool deal for the state, or at least it seemed. But then it's been criticised that because people weren't trying very hard, because all people were trying to do is avoid punishment, they didn't work very hard. A lot of the things made by the Gulag were actually of low quality and weren't actually worth the investment. So that's an interesting argument. They're essentially saying that if you don't give workers a reason to work other than fear, you're not going to get good work out of them, which to me makes a lot of sense. The author of this book, he was a hard worker, but he wasn't working hard on the monotonous activities in the freezing cold. No, no, what he was working on was his book. He used a rosemary and he, there's an interesting story of he became a convert of Christianity and he was using that rosemary to write his book, so he had a monologue in his head of what the book was going to be, and he was writing it in his head, and that was what kept him going, he had order. I mean, I once did a Shakespeare play, I barely remembered my parts, and I only had a few lines. This guy, he's remembering entire pages, all in his head, using nothing but a bunch of prayer beads, that's absolutely astounding. Now, I, I want to move on, because, you know, I don't stretch this bit out too long. Now, the interesting thing about throwing people in the gulag was they had quotas to me. The officers who'd throw people in the gulag, if they didn't get enough people, you know, who's to say they aren't enemies of state? And who's to say they wouldn't end up in the gulag? So they had to meet a quota. So if the wife of someone they threw in the gulag comes knocking and says, excuse me, where's my husband? Am I going to see him again? No, what would happen is they'd probably just throw her in as well. Which is pretty messed up. It would be a situation where, let's say, you go on a date with someone and you're one of the policemen. You could just say, no, nah, I don't like it very much and she seemed like a bit of a dick, so I'm just going to throw in the gulag. It could be the... If you want to steal someone's husband, you could just tell someone that guy is a capitalist. He's not a true communist, he's not a true Marxist. Throw him in jail. And you go to the gulag and you could steal someone's man while they rot in a gulag. It, the whole thing was really bizarre. It sounds like something out of a, a, a wacky Will Ferrell movie. But that's what it was. I, and the numbers of how many people died is all over the place because a lot of the records are destroyed and there's a debate of what do you count as killing someone? Obviously in London, pollution is really terrible and a lot of people die who wouldn't have otherwise died because of air pollution. You have a similar situation with people who survived the gulag quite often were exiled to Siberia where they froze to death. Is that murder? I mean, I think it's similar to a situation of leaving someone on a desert island to die. It's a very similar situation. You don't really care, but you want them out of the picture and you're perfectly willing to let them die, and you're probably hoping that quite a few of them do die, so yeah, I'd say that is the same. But there's a situation of those who survived. There are people who'd catch tuberculosis because they were kept in terrible isolation cells, and their lives would be much shorter, even if they got out. 
they would then die and their lives would be cut short. But that's the thing. If someone dies five years earlier because they're already quite old, well, I'd still, I, I say that's still murder, but what if someone's fairly young, they don't die, but they get a terrible disease and their life's cut short? Is that murder? There's a debate. I would say the answer to all of these would be yes, and that would mean the range of death goes from just below 10 million to all the way up to 50 million. So the range is huge. Records have been destroyed. I'm not saying it's just the USSR that did this. I think Britain did something similar with uh, something called Operation Legacy. But you see how empires of one kind or another were really tyrannical and how it could all be used to keep the working man down, even when, in the case of the USSR, it was supposedly for his benefit. There is also the development of what seemed to be a new ethnicity, a new minority. If you oppress a group and they're not able to live free lives as individuals, they go to vicarious living. So whether it's a religion, whether it's a group identity by race or language, they sort of come together and they sort of live as one of a group. Once Stalin had died and the story of One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich was written, a lot of people identified with that. It was almost like its own religion, its own, uh, I don't say cult, but its own sort of clique. People felt like they didn't belong in society once they'd gotten out because no one else seemed to understand it, because people didn't talk about it. But they all felt a sort of sense of brotherhood. I mean, they had to crawl over each other when they were in the prison, but there was something there where they felt a sense of not belonging. You know, it wasn't a spiritual awakening so much as it was. It was a horror that only someone else who'd been there could truly understand. So that, that's the bizarre thing. And in terms of the number of people who died, this book, these books are more qualitative than quantitative. I've had a look myself and the numbers vary wildly. In some years, you know, as many as 10% of the population would die. And if you were there for 10 years, which was for a good amount of time, the average, your chances of surviving might not have been great. Of course, it started off as eight years as their default, then it was 10 years, then it got put as 25 years because they realized, ooh, free labor, we can use this for the state. But the amount of people dying each year did decrease as well. And some of the lower estimates say that overall only 10% of the population died overall. But you can see how it seems a bit odd how in one year you have 10% of the population dying and then saying overall only 10% died is... That there are lots of estimates and the thing is, if you are inclined to defend the system, I'm sure you can find numbers which are lower. It depends where you draw the line. The simple route is, no matter how many it was, it was too many. Horrifying and... It's mortifying. The fact I haven't heard that much about it. I mean, I've heard about concentration camps, but the gulag is... If it were fiction, it'd almost be hilarious how stupidly horrifying it is. You'd have people torturing each other, you'd have people breaking each other down, and the amount of sadism of people being taught that if someone had more than you, they were the enemy. There was a situation where, let's say you were a doctor and you got thrown into a gulag. Because you had succeeded, you could only have achieved that through cheating. Meritocracy was inexistent in every single way. So if you were a criminal, that was society's fault. But if you were successful, well, that was because you cheated. So in this sort of moral hierarchy, the criminals were put higher than you. And quite often, they were used to help run the prison. The whole thing was really, really bizarre. I cannot do justice to this book. I'd recommend anyone read it, but the truth is I don't think most people have the interest or the stamina to read it. So I would say it is a challenge, and only if you have a severe interest in what human beings are capable of, only if you have an interest in Russia, only if you have an interest in reading books that are very important, but most people wouldn't have the goal to read just because of most people do not have the stamina to go through it all, and most people do not have the interest. But aside from those two reasons, there's no reason everyone shouldn't read these books. The only reason people shouldn't read these books is because they probably wouldn't finish them. I would recommend people go through One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich just because that's a short book. You could read it in probably about a day or so. It's only about, I think, 100 pages. It, it, it's a very small book. It's about that long. So 100 pages of pages that size. Um, the Archipelago, that's a whole different beast. Okay, guys, so I'm going to leave it here. If you like the video, leave a like. If you want to subscribe to see more videos like this, make sure you uh, tick the bell. And I hope you all have a good day. I'll put some more books here. I'm going to do some reflecting, I think.